Curtis, send help. What do all these microphone specifications mean and what do I need to care about and what do I need to worry about? Don't worry, we've got you. This episode, we'll talk exactly about the common microphone specifications, what they mean, what impacts they might have on your recording. But before we start, this episode is brought to you by me and Learn Light and Sound. We have courses on how to improve your lighting and sound for video, link down below. Okay, first specification you'll probably encounter is called either element type or acoustic principle. And really what we're looking for here for recording dialogue, which is the focus of this, by the way, using microphones like a boom microphone or an XLR based microphone, or maybe a lavalier microphone. The first one is, is it a dynamic microphone or is it an condenser microphone? And it will often be listed as element type or acoustic principle or something like that. But usually what we're trying to figure out is this a condenser or a dynamic and both are good microphones there's not one that's better than the other necessarily so if we can characterize these two types of microphones let me just kind of put it this way dynamic microphones typically sound a little bit more broadcasty especially if you're using them up close and by broadcasty what i mean is they tend to be somewhat they tend to emphasize some of the bass response a little bit so people want that radio voice um that's one thing if you, again, if you use them up close, not always the case, but that can be a kind of a feature of it. A lot of people think that dynamic microphones are better at rejecting noise. So if you have a room that you're recording in that's not acoustically treated, that where sound bounces off all the hard walls and comes back to your microphone and you get an echo, which is technically actually a reverb sound, dynamic microphones are not better at rejecting that stuff. But the fact that most people use them up very close because they require a lot more gain and they use them up close because that's what the broadcasters do. That is improving the signal to noise ratio. That is to say your voice is closer to the microphone capsule. So the microphone can more easily capture your voice. Therefore, you don't need quite as much gain as you would if, as if you were farther away. And because of that, it's gonna pick up less of the room noise. It's, it's more a factor of how close you are to the mic than it is the type of microphone. So keep that in mind. But if you are working in an untreated space and you don't mind having a microphone very close to you, I think a dynamic microphone is a good choice. Now, condenser microphones. These come in a few different types. Sometimes they're RF bias microphones or they're DC bias. They um, often have JFET. All of those are condenser microphones. Condenser microphones typically need power, almost always phantom power, which is 48 volts. It'll be indicated as a P48 or something like that. We'll get to that a little bit later. But in any case, Condenser microphones tend to pick up some of the higher frequencies a little bit better. So they tend to have kind of an extended frequency response. We'll talk about frequency response a little bit later, but they'll tend to be a little crisper and brighter in some cases. Not always, you know, there, there's lots of variance, but that's often the case. So when I can, I prefer to use condenser microphones, but dynamic microphones have their place too. If I'm out on the show floor, interviewing someone, I think I'd rather have a dynamic microphone in most cases. So those are some things to consider about those two things. Now, the next specification to consider is polar pattern. And this is sometimes called pickup pattern. This refers to how directional the microphone is and what directionality does for you is it helps eliminate noise in the space that you're recording. It doesn't eliminate the noise, actually. It just doesn't pick it up. as It's not as sensitive to the noise. Usually the noise that's behind the microphone. So there are two main polar patterns that we're looking for in dialogue recording microphones. Number one is a cardioid polar pattern. And what this means is that it's most sensitive on the front of the microphone. As you get off as, a, as noise or sound is coming from the sides of the microphone, it's a little bit less sensitive to that sound. So it's not gonna pick up quite as much of it. And then on the back of the microphone, it is its least sensitive. So it's not going to pick up almost any of the sound coming from the back, at least in theory. Now. Sound is complex in terms of how it moves through a space. When I say something, it'll bounce off a wall and come around and it may hit the back of the microphone and it'll come in on the sides as well. So it's these polar patterns are not perfect rejecting everything except for your voice. Just keep that in mind. But the closer you are to them, the less room sound it will generally pick up. Something to keep in mind. The other kind of polar pattern we often see with dialogue microphones, specifically boom microphones, like what we're using here, is a supercardioid polar pattern. Now, the difference of a from a cardioid to a supercardioid is that a supercardioid is more focused on the front. It has a narrower polar pattern, narrower pickup pattern on the front. And as you, as sounds come from the side, it is even less sensitive to those than a cardioid microphone is. 
but it does have a little bit of a, a little bit more sensitivity on the back of the microphone. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. This works pretty nicely for boom microphones because typically with boom microphones, you're working a little bit farther from them. So you want a slightly narrower, more focused, sensitive area on the front of the microphone. And that's what a, a super cardioid microphone typically offers. So almost always boom microphones are super cardioid. All right, frequency response. Now, frequency response refers to how sensitive a mic is at capturing each frequency across the audible frequency spectrum. So if you look at a frequency response chart, you'll notice what you're looking for is how even is it generally across the entire spectrum. And oftentimes what you'll find is that there will be a point in the lower frequencies where it starts to fall off and not pick up as much sound. That's pretty common. And then also in the higher frequencies, they'll start to fall off at a certain point as well. Dynamic microphones, incidentally, will start to fall off sooner. They'll be less sensitive to those higher frequencies than a condenser microphone will be. So what are some things to look at in these? A lot of times, too, you'll see kind of a bump in sensitivity, an increase in sensitivity, somewhere between 5 and 10 kilohertz. It's really common, especially, you know, it's just really common. <laughs> and it's not always a good thing, and it's not always a bad thing. But for those that have sibilant voices, lots of that sizzling energy when they say the letter S and C, having too much of a boost in those frequencies between 5 and 10 kilohertz will make the sibilance capture in your recordings more prominent. And it will be, it will, it will be annoying to listen to for your audience. So <laughs> it's something to avoid if you, if you see a lot of that in a microphone spec in a frequency response chart. That's not the only thing. And to be honest, these frequency response charts that you typically see that are published by the microphone manufacturers, they are massively averaged. A lot of times they'll look super smooth acro across the frequency spectrum. In reality, there's probably a lot more of this going on. There's probably a lot more ups and downs through that whole thing. They're just sort of averaging it out. And it's only the really high-end professional microphones that will ship. When you buy one of their microphones, it will ship with a frequency response chart specific to that one copy of the microphone. Whereas the less expensive microphones, they'll just publish a general, hey, we measured some of these in our lab, and this is basically what your microphone should do. But it wasn't a measurement of your microphone necessarily. So just keep that in mind as well. What you're looking for, again, the main thing that I look for is that if I have a very bassy voice, I'm not going to want a microphone that has a lot of emphasis, a lot of sensitivity in the lower frequencies. And by lower frequencies, I'm talking anywhere between 40 hertz and maybe up to 200 hertz or something like that. If you have a really bassy voice and you use a microphone like that, it'll start to, the bass will start to sound overwhelming and it starts to kind of sound, it's fatiguing to listen to. It'll sort of sound, whoa, 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 whoa. It really kind of woolly and too much bass. And then, as we mentioned before, there's the whole sibilance matter as well. So it's really hard to just look at a frequency response chart and say, that one would be great for my voice. But those are some, a couple of things you can look at there. All right, next specification is output impedance. Now on XLR-based microphones, what you're looking for here is what, what is that output impedance? And usually for most XLR-based professional quality microphones, that output impedance is gonna vary somewhere between 50 ohms and about 200 ohms. That's pretty typical. And so what does this mean? Well, it's an electrical property, and we're not gonna get into all the physics of it, but what you're looking for, why this matters, is that you kind of need to, you don't need to worry about this a whole lot in today's modern equipment. Almost any XLR microphone will work with almost any audio interface, field recorder, etc. But here's one consideration. If your microphone's output impedance is 100 ohms, you're looking for the input impedance on your preamplifier, whether that's an audio interface or a, a field recorder, whatever it is, for the input impedance on that field recorder or audio interface to be 10 times what the output impedance is on your mic. So if I have a 100 ohm output impedance mic to achieve what is called a bridging impedance, I typically want that to be 10 or 1000 ohms, excuse me, not 10,000, 10 times the output impedance of the microphone. So 1000 ohms input impedance on my preamplifier. If I have a 200 ohm output microphone, then I probably want something with a 2000 ohm input or more. So that's just a rule of thumb and there's no hard and fast. And what, what if it doesn't? What if I have a 200 ohm output microphone and my preamplifier's input impedance is only a thousand ohms? What happens? Am I in trouble? Is something gonna catch on fire? No, 
Nothing's gonna, nothing's probably gonna get damaged and nothing's gonna catch on fire. The only thing you may notice in some cases is it may color the sound that the microphone is picking up. It may be not operating optimally for the way it was designed. That's a rule of thumb. Again, it's not hard and fast, but just be aware if you're using a preamplifier that only has about a thousand ohm input, some of your microphones that have higher output impedances may be a little bit colored when you're when you're using them. Just something to keep in mind, not something to worry about, diff, you know, seriously. And certainly nothing's gonna catch on fire or get damaged. In fact, in some for some vintage gear, they intentionally have a variable input impedance on a preamplifier so that you can experiment and see what it does to the sound of your microphone and see if it sounds cool and vintage-y. So there, there's, <laughs> that's input impedance. The next specification is sensitivity. Sometimes it's listed as output level. And that's one thing I should mention here too. None of these are standardized across the, the microphone manufacturers. They all report different specs. They may report them with different names. I apologize on behalf of the microphone <laughs> manufacturing world. I'm not really responsible for that, but they use different names and they don't all report all the same specs and so on and so forth. But sensitivity is an important one. This is the strength of the output signal from the microphone is one way you can think of it, or you could also think of it as how much gain your preamplifier is going to need to supply to your microphone in order to get a healthy recording level. So what is the output, you know, what, what are you looking for? What's ideal here? Well, typically, first of all, condenser microphones are going to have a higher sensitivity. Sensitivity is typically reported in minus, say, 32 dB, uh, volts per Pascal. So it's that doesn't mean a lot to, to most of us. <laughs> but the closer the number is to zero, the more sensitive the microphone. Typically, dynamic microphones are going to be less sensitive. The output signal from a dynamic microphone is going to be lower, and it's going to record, require more gain on your preamplifier to get a workable, healthy recording level. Condenser microphones typically have a higher sensitivity or a stronger output signal, or they require less gain, all different ways of saying kind of the same thing. So the one thing to keep in mind here, if you're going to be using a dynamic microphone, say for example, the Shure SM7B, one of the most, the least sensitive microphones on the market, the modern microphones on the market. Great microphone, lots of podcasters love that thing. Live streamers love it too. Even musicians love it. Even Michael Jackson's producer used it on some of his recordings, the previous version of it. But you're gonna make, you need to make sure that your preamplifier can supply a good bit of gain, probably 60 dB at least. I'd recommend them being able to supply at least 65 dB of gain, but 60 to 65 dB of gain is gonna be kind of, I would say, what you're going to need for a microphone like a Shure SM7B. Otherwise, you may need to use another kind of inline preamplifier like a cloud lifter or a fat head. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just make sure that your preamplifier, and most of the modern quality ones do, have at least 60 dB of gain, preferably a little bit more than that. So that's what you need to know about sensitivity. All right, next is max SPL. SPL stands for sound pressure level. So what's the max sound pressure level that your microphone can handle? This is basically a measure of the loudest sound that your microphone can capture without distorting. So if you're planning to record super loud noises, if you're gonna go out to air shows and record super loud, close distance airplanes, aircraft, jet engines, um, anything really, really loud, you're going to wanna look at this max SPL spec and you're probably gonna want something that's like a 130 dB SPL or maybe even higher than that. They go up, you know, sometimes see sun as high as 140, 145. But if you're gonna be recording really loud sounds, you need to care about that. Now, if you're recording dialogue or even singing, usually you don't need quite that much. Maybe 120 is probably gonna be enough. I would say though, one thing to keep in mind, if you're talking, if you're looking at lavalier microphones, lavalier microphones tend not to have max SPL specs that are quite as high. So for example, if you're gonna be recording a horror film and you're gonna go from a whisper to a scream, make sure that when you're looking at your lavalier microphones that you're potentially going to use, that they have a max SPL that's at least 120, preferably a little bit more, if you wanna make sure you capture those screams without a lot of distortion. So those are some things to think about there with max SPL. The next spec is self noise. This is usually reported in dBA weighted. Here's the thing. Every electronic circuit generates some noise. 
There's no such thing as a perfectly noise-free microphone. They all generate some noise. But you want to kind of minimize that. You generally don't want a ton of that noise. And what's a good measurement there? Well, it depends. <laughs> One of the quietest microphones are the lowest self-noise microphones on the market. The lowest ones that I've seen are generally around 4 dB A-weighted. That's a really, really good performance. For me, an acceptable performance is usually like somewhere around 16 dB or less A-weighted. If it's more than that, it may sometimes become a problem. Now, remember, this is self-noise that the microphone is generating. This is not referring to any noise in your recording space. And I hear a lot of people say, I got this microphone and it's really noisy. Well, what is what is really happening is a room is noisy. It's not the microphone that's noisy. So make sure you keep those two ideas separate. They're not the same thing. So if you have a noisy room, that's a separate matter, but we're talking specifically here about the self noise generated by the microphone. So you can get away with, you know, if you do have something that has a 20 dB self noise, you may have to use some noise reduction in post to get a clean recording. All right, next specification is a power requirement. And usually, again, for condenser microphones, this is going to be phantom power, which is typically 48 volts. In some cases, it may only be 24 volts or maybe even 12 volts, but almost always it's 48 volts. So if you are going to use a condenser microphone that requires 48 volts, make sure that your recorder or audio interface can supply that. Dynamic microphones, modern dynamic microphones, uh, some people get worried, like if there's a switch on your audio interface and when you push it, it turns on phantom power for all of the inputs and you're going to use a dynamic microphone and a condenser microphone. They're worried that they might damage their dynamic microphone. Typically, that's not going to be a problem. All of the modern quality dynamic microphones are made to be able to, to work, even though they're being fed phantom power. It's not an issue. It's not going to damage your microphone. As far as lavalier microphones, they typically require three to five volts of plug-in power. So keep that in mind as well. Now, some of the more modern like pocket recorders that take lavalier microphones and have lavalier microphone inputs or the wireless microphone systems, the consumer wireless microphone systems, most of these don't supply three to five volts. So be careful if you're going to be using a professional grade lavalier microphone and a consumer grade recorder or wireless transmitter, just make sure that that can supply enough voltage so that you don't potentially damage your microphone. Now, usually you won't damage the microphone, but you may not get the optimal performance out of that microphone. So just keep that in mind. Now, there's one other thing that's not exactly necessarily a spec, but it may be listed with the specifications. It's more of a feature. And that is say, for example, a high pass filter or a low cut filter, two names for basically the same thing. You do want to kind of pay attention to that depending on what you're trying to do with your microphone. I've seen them range from maybe 60 Hertz as a spec for the high pass filter or up to even 250, even 300 Hertz. And there's a difference there. So I'm using a boom microphone right here. This is a Sennheiser MKH-50. When I turn, it has a high pass filter. When I turn that high pass filter on, the center of the high pass filter is at 250 Hertz. What that means is that if I turn that on, it's going to remove some of the bass from my record, from my voice recording through that microphone it's gonna sound much thinner and not as warm. And the reason they did that on this mic is if you're using it not as a boom microphone, but up close as a close mic, it has a lot of proximity effect. That is to say, as I get up close to the mic, the bass response just kind of goes through the roof. It gets really sensitive to that. And that's why they put that really aggressive 250 Hertz high pass filter on there. However, when I'm using it in a more natural boom position, here it's about 18 centimeters from me, you know, between 35 and 40 centimeters, 18 inches, I should say. Did I say something else? Whatever. <laughs> 18 inches, somewhere around 40 centimeters. If I turn that 250 hertz pass, high pass filter on, it's going to make my voice sound really, really thin. So not a, you're not probably going to use that in that case. If you're using a large diaphragm condenser microphone and it has an 80 hertz high pass filter, that's perfect for voice. For men's voices, you're not going to usually affect the men's voices and you're certainly not going to affect women's voices. It's just going to remove some of the rumble um, and the low frequency kind of vibrations in the space. So you don't get that in your recording, kind of muddling things up. All right. Those are kind of the main specifications. I hope that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. I'll do my best to answer those. Get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again soon.